I just want to talk briefly about the history and origins of jazz dance as a technique. And the first thing I've always thought is best to do is to figure out what is the word jazz. Like to us, it means a lot of things, but it means one thing in particular. It means this, and it means this, and those are nice physical metaphors, kinetic metaphors, but where does the word come from? J-A-Z-Z. -Z. Well, it can come from a variety of places, but the one that they've been able to trace it to is the west coast of this country. And people started using it to refer to a lot of things in um, the 1910s. They also even spelled it another way, J-A-S-S. -S. They started to use it to refer to music around this year, 1915. And the main style that we were accustomed to hearing when we talked of jazz at that time was ragtime. Then by the 1920s, we had another form. We had New Orleans style. We had swing. In the 30s and 40s, swing gave way to bebop in the 1950s. Then there was free form. Then there was Afro. Uh, Cuban or Brazilian and uh, then we went on to fusion in the 70s we had oh, acid jazz smooth jazz that we still have in all of our finest elevators and new jazz is probably the newest form N-U-J-A-Z-Z -Z. so we have tons and tons of forms that grew out of this one thing as far as subgenres of a musical genre. But as far as dance is concerned, jazz as a dance form is made up of equal parts of four dance genres. I'm not going to give any one genre particular preference. I just want to say what they are and what they give this form. So the first would be social dance forms. From social dance uh, forms, jazz gets emphasis on personal style. It gets constant change. because of popular culture. Now, back in the 1920s, popular culture was whatever girls were wearing, young ladies were wearing, flappers in particular, fringy dresses, boots that flapped open. Now it's Lady Gaga walking out on an award ceremony station dressed in me. It's like it just runs the gamut, but that does influence what we do with this technique. The next thing that influenced it, of course, was tap dance. Tap dance gives it a certain kind of rhythm, also gives it a certain kind of punch. You hear me say in technique classes that like certain tips of the foot or something like that has a tap sensibility to it, and so therefore we get that from that. We get, uh, I spelled that wrong. We get a further articulated sense of rhythm from world dance forms, such as West Indian, meaning anything that was happening in the countries, the subtropic countries underneath our continent, like Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Jamaica and what have you. We also get East Indian, particularly Katak and Bharatanatyam, both use body articulation, which I'll go into in a little bit, and also use foot articulation as well. Flamenco from Spain. is another one that has a huge influence on this dance form. And last but not least, I'm gonna put them together. Some people may not like that, but I'm gonna put them together for the sake of today. Ballet and modern dance technique. Modern is also a hybrid technique, but ballet is the one that has a little bit more um, age on it. And from both of them, you get line, you get clarity, you get weight, you get elements of movement that are used to describe movement. And the best thing is that you get a vocabulary with which to wrap all these things up when you don't have, um, when you run out of like images or when you run out of words or um, in the case of that new um, fangled jazz technique, jump rhythm jazz, when doesn't work, you have plie, 
Ramacham, and so on and so forth. Now, this came together to make this over an approximate 30 to 45 year period of time. Of course, it started back in the 1910s with the music. Um, social dance, as far as dance was concerned, steps that were being done by little kids on street corners, but also ballroom dance was also something that informed it. And then you had the vaudeville, the nightclub, and the people who were performing on Broadway bridging these two together and making something that was very elegant. It was very much a part of their time. It was very much a part of their dancing body. Probably the most famous progenitors of doing this this way are people like Vernon and Irene Castle, Fred Astaire, uh, Marilyn Miller would be another one. Um, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. When we start to bring this element into it, we start to really talk about the people who have taught us jazz dance and given us jazz dance as we know it now. Let me just clear this part of the board. And let me work backwards and go this way. The first person to give us something that is identifiable as jazz dance comes prized of all of these elements is a man by the name of Jack Cole. Cole was born approximately in 1909. He lived until 1975. His real name is John Ewing Cole, if I'm not mistaken. And Mr. Cole danced for Dennis Sean. He worked with Ted Sean in particular, and his personality was such that he didn't get along with Ted Sean. You can't have two lions in the same cage, so to say. So he broke off on his own. He had learned from Dennis Sean and from Ted Sean ways of deportment for the male dancing body, as well as ways of using these and also using modern technique. And that's when he began to bridge together something that he would have, that he would develop as a technique, and he would actually do some really wonderful things. For example, the first thing he did was he got a contract to choreograph musicals in um, 1940s at Columbia Pictures. What he did is he became their chief choreographer, And he put together a company of dancers to work together, to work together to learn his style of movement and to perform in the musicals that Columbia Pictures produced. And some of these people include, but are not limited to, the fabulous Gwen Burden. There's more on that as it develops. And the stars that were uh, working in the Columbia Pictures uh, productions, such as Rita Hayworth, most importantly, but also Ann Miller to a certain extent. The next person to add to this equation is someone who worked at MGM dancing for Gene Kelly and the other choreographers that worked at MGM. His name is Eugene Pachuto, but he's better known as Luigi, or as Liza Minnelli likes to call him, Papa, okay? He started as a dancer. He was born actually in the same place where Dean Martin was born. He was born in Studentville, Ohio, and he started as a dancer in film musicals. He suffered a terrific car accident lost the use of his body, and was told that he would never walk again, which he just simply didn't, refused to accept. So he worked on developing a theory that would re-strengthen him so he could get back out there and dance again, and he started to perform again in musicals in the 1950s. Um, what he did then was he moved to New York City after about 1954, 1955, because screen musicals were starting to uh, experience a period of downsizing from which I technically feel they have never recovered. Uh, and he went into a studio, started teaching class to dancers who were working on Broadway. And certain images of going up and down, going down at the same time. Were the basics of his theory. And then his philosophy, of course, never stopped moving. Very important name in the development of jazz dance as a theory and a technique. The next person to take this to the next level actually didn't do it in uh, New York City or in Hollywood. 
He did it in Chicago. And he is somebody that I am very happy to have gotten the chance to meet while he was still around. His name is Gus Giordano. Oops. Now he is a contemporary of Luigi's, and a lot of what he does with technique he learned from Luigi. Uh, but he took it out of that place and brought it to the heartland, which is Chicago. And in essence, he created a full circle because if we've got this word attached to this form of music, now we've got this word also attached to this dance form that's happening in the same place about in the 1960s. I've no doubt, this is me theoreticizing, but I think the reason why he left the world of New York City behind was because he wanted to start a family. And he was a very staunch Midwesterner. So he took his um, wife, Peg, back to Chicago. They bought a house in Wilmette, and they bought this space, one of the most famous locations for dance in the world, 640 Davis Street in Evanston, Illinois. And notice what I said, he bought the space. So therefore, once he owned it and paid it off in full, nobody could kick him out or move him. So therefore, he was able to stay there, and his company lives there, and his studio is still there. And this used to be the home of the World Jazz Dance Congresses, but when they caught on in the 1980s, they just moved them all over the place. Now they'll have them in Buffalo, New York, they'll have them in Europe, they're incredible. The company is very strong, that bears his name. Not only is there this company, but there's also Giordano too. The company used to uh, perform his works exclusively, now they perform repertory works as well, so they have choreographers like Randy Duncan, and. Um, I think that Mia Michaels has put a piece on them. They have a large profile as far as that's concerned. They're a fabulous company, or I should say they are fabulous companies. And so in that same tradition, although some people would disagree with me, I like to say that Lucanti falls under Gus Giordano because he did the same things that Giordano did, and he did them almost in tandem with him. Um, Gus had his company since the 60s. Lou formed his company in the 70s. Um, Gus began to branch out and have a second training company in the 80s. He followed suit in the late 1980s. Uh, eventually, the only thing that Lou did before Gus is that Lou left his company and turned artistic directorship over to someone else before Gus did. Gus never really did that. He always stayed in the pie somewhere. Eventually, as he got older, though, a lot of the teaching duties and artistic directorship fell to his daughter, Dan. And um, eventually, he did pass away. He passed away very recently, as a matter of fact. But his presence continues to be felt. As a matter of fact, a company in Chicago has produced an incredible documentary about Mr. Giordano. And eventually, I'm going to get it, and I'm going to show it in class one day. But for now, we just have to let that slide. And so, there are many other figures that can be spoken of. As a matter of fact, let me end up with this really fun story, and then that will be, in essence, your mini introduction to the history of jazz dance. Um, in the 1940s, Jack Cole choreographed this really cool production number for his nightclub act called Sing Sing Sing. And Gwen Burden was one of the dancers in it. And so Gwen Burden was making a career for himself dancing in movies that Jack Cole was choreographing, like uh, On the Riviera, for example, a version of uh, the light opera, The Merry Widow. She was one of the can can dancers in there. She's incredible. Well, anywho, she eventually found her way to Broadway, and she eventually found her way into the life of Bob Fosse. And Fosse always felt that uh, Mr. Cole never forgave him for wooing Gwen away from him. So what he did is he promised he'd make it up to him. So a couple years after he died, Bob Fosse got the idea, kind of because he was mad at Michael Bennett, to do this show that was just strictly dancing. It's called Dancing. And it uh, debuted on Broadway in the late 1970s. And he did this number, Sing, 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 and he did it out of respect to Jack Cole. As a matter of fact, he did all the steps that we know from the number. He did them all based on Jack Cole's movement. So therefore, it's not Fosse that you're seeing when you see Sing, Sing, Sing. You're seeing Jack Cole. So that's where I'm going to stop this talk right now. Thanks for coming. <laughs>